um, I'm, I'm going to minister on, um, on your garden. Now, I've, I've got a mother-in-law. She, she, she likes gardening. And whatever she puts in the ground just flourished. You know, it's just amazing. Everything works out perfectly. And uh, coming from the free state, um, things are a bit different there. I don't know if you've been there. But in the winter time, everything dies. Dead, dead, dead. Now it's white, whiter, whiter. Rr, rr, rr. That's from the ice. We had fish there, and, and, and the pond just froze up. And the fish in the pond were like ice age. They were frozen. True story. I've seen it with my own eyes. I thought it's not possible, but it's possible. And I'm going to tell you something else, and maybe you won't believe that as well, but I've seen it with my own eyes. During the day, at 11 o'clock, the ice melted and it was water. And I thought the fish will be dead. The fish will swim me. And apparently fish can do that. I never knew that. Apparently fish can do that. I don't know for how long, but fish can do that. And don't don't believe me, some of you are looking like me. Yeah, right, Pastor, come on, man. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Free state fish. <laughs> well, then we moved to Barberton. I'm telling you a bit of our story, you know. Then we moved to Barberton. And uh, it was very, very hot. Marty was pregnant with our second girl, second child, and we felt like we moved to hell. Yes, I promise you. I asked the, the chairman of the board of the church, what is the difference between the winter and the summer? Because it's an important question where we come from. Because in summer it's 33, 34, and in winter it's minus 7, minus 8. Even sometimes we had temperatures of minus 11 lying in our bed with everything on underground heating the heaters on everything on and when you it's just you can see the cold you can you can just see the steam in there so um, coming from from that part of the world it's it's really an important question to say listen what's the temperature differences between winter and summer and and he looked at me as if I'm a crazy man but I, I didn't know why. I only realized now that it's, it might seem as if, if somebody asked me that question, I'll, I'll also say, come on, man. Are you serious about this? But I looked at him very with a straight face and very serious, and he looked at me like this. He said, I don't know how to explain this, but in the wintertime, we put off the fans. I promise you that was his answer. And it's the truth. In winter times, we put off the fans, and we're going on. But moving here, I was too scared to put my broom somewhere in the garden because it might grow. Everything's growing here. 98% of what you put in the ground just grow. And faster and stronger and more even like what you wanted it to grow. I mean, if you plant something in the free state, a plant will grow up to this height. But you do the same thing here and it just becomes a tree. You know what I'm talking about. So this morning I'm ministering on that. And, and, and the reason why I'm ministering on that is in the free state, I was working in the garden maybe once every second week. And in the winter, not at all because everything's dead. You just cut everything off. No work. Till summertime. Here you are working through the winter because not even the grass dies here. You just cut it every second or third week then. But it's still growing, still going on, not dying at all. So I'm reading something similar here in the Word of God in Genesis 2. And I want to explain it like in the free state, I don't want to be a gardener there. Not what, what I know now, I don't want to go back. But I would not mind being a gardener here. But some people might think, I think I'll rather be a gardener in the free state because it's not so much work. <laughs> and some of you are smiling. Ha ha, I've been caught out right now. Let's look at the word of God in Genesis 2. 
And I'm going to read to you out of Genesis 2 from verse 5. Um, so now no shrubs had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprang up from the Lord God uh, from, from, uh, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. Can we read that in the English Standard Version? When no brush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the, on the land and there was no man to work the ground. A very interesting verse. And when we look at the, that verse, we can see very clearly that God is keeping the rain away from the land. And the reason why there's no rain is not because God feels it's not raining season or it's not the time to send rain or that God has in his mind, I don't need growth there. <coughs> because God already has a predetermined outcome that he wants to see. God wants to see the plants growing, the trees there, everything wonderful, beautiful, everything's there in its place. God wants that. So God, what will be the reason for you not to send the rain so that the growth can start what will be the reason there was no man the reason is not that God is selfish or that it's the wrong time the reason is there is no man the problem many a times in our lives is not that God doesn't want to send the rain there's no man to do the work and God wants to send the rain. He wants the plants and everything to grow. That's, that's what He wants. But where's the man? It's God's desire that we will have a beautiful garden. Great lives. But where's the man to do that? So I want to say this morning... That whatever your heart's desire, but there's not a man to do the work, God will not send the rain. And you might think, Father, why aren't you sending the rain? And we sing it in church. God sent the rain. And we sing it together with everyone. Pour out your spirit. But we're too lazy to do the work. And when we're too lazy to do the work, God will not send the rain so there will be no growth. In one verse, God needs man before he can send the rain. We want it the other way around. Lord sent the rain and we will see what's going on around us so that we can then start to do the work. <laughs> Nia, broer. Work first, then rain. Man first to do the work because God will not bless you if you are not willing to do your part. Now I say this, God will not bless your marriage he will not send the rain over your marriage if you are not willing to do the work. God will not send the rain over your ministry if you are not willing to do the work. God will not send the rain over your children if you are not willing to take the work and make it your hand. That's God. We need to get up and work. And now I hear the people say, Oh Lord, you know what? It's because cause of Adam and Eve and what they did in the garden that we have to work can we just read uh, a bit further I think it's what what is that verse verse um, 15 when you read verse 15 can you read it with me the Lord God took the let's read it with me 
the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden too. And we need to work and keep watch over it. Now tell me, to answer the previous question, we need to answer and say, is this before the fall of man or after the fall of man? Genesis 2 verse 15. Before the fall of man. But we read here before the fall of man that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden for what reason? To work and to? So is working then part of the sin? The cause of sin? No, God has put work and keeping as part of the blessing for us. Something new? God has made us to work and to keep watch. And we've done that last week. The, uh, the, the, the English Standard Version says, to, we, 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 are, we are made to have dominion over everything. Genesis 1 verse 28. God has predetermined already the outcome. God knows what He wants. He's God. It's His plan. But if there's no man to do the work, if there's no man to keep watch over it, God will not send the rain or the blessing over your life. So we, we, we sit here with a problem, church, that a lot of us are doing the work, but not because we want to work. We've got the attitude that work is not a good thing. It's not a blessing. And I know afterwards, the reason is for Adam and Eve. Are you here? We have to, we have to, we have to get hold of this right now. You have to understand this. In the garden, who did they work for? They worked for themselves. Who was reaping all of the benefits Adam and Eve so if they work they will eat from their work if they keep and watch over it they will prosper and everything will be in harmony they are working for themselves I don't know if I must say this but God has made man so that the work and keep that he's doing he will prosper and benefit and have dominion over that himself that's what we are created for and the problem that we are struggling with this church the problem that we are struggling is that after the fall of man we are having the mentality and the attitude of a slave we are in bondage. So now, can you put up the, 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 that, that pictures for us, please, Keenan? Now we are looking like the guys here on my right, on your right as well. Do you see that guy up there? Come on. Do this manager even know what target he's getting, giving me? Has he ever done my work? I'm in bondage. I'm a slave. Look at the people. They're sitting in a row working in slavery. They, they are in slavery, not prospering not enjoying it why because they do not receive the benefit for what they are doing they are not doing it for themselves they are doing it so that someone else can prosper they are not having the dominion but the other guys they look happy they look prosperous they're in charge they have dominion what, what will be the reason they are not slaves they are managers they are reaping the benefit for what they are doing well I've done things for other people it's not as easy I'm not saying it's wrong and you shouldn't do that that's serving 
we have to serve as well. We have to serve others. That's by the love and by the grace of God that we are serving others. I understand that. But let's be honest, by serving others, a lot of times I'm serving others because I know they are also serving me. Because we are family. It's easy for me to serve my wife. It's easy for me to serve my children because they're also serving and helping me. We are part of the same team. And in church, we must have that attitude. By serving you, I'm also helping myself. And the whole faith family can prosper from each other by serving each other in church. That is God's intent for us. But when I do something just for myself, when I'm out there doing an extra course or an extra meeting, and I know I'm getting paid for that, and I will be benefit, and my children and my wife, we will benefit from that then it's really easy to set that time apart to do that. Why? Because I will directly benefit from it. Come on. So it's easy when we do it for the benefit of your family or, or for your own benefit. It's not so easy when we do it for others. But because God has a predetermined outcome, he doesn't want us to be slaves. He still made us to have dominion, to be in charge, to be able to say, I'm doing this as a manager and not as a slave of sin. And the problem is in church and in churches that we have this small church mentality that say, listen, it's just a small church. You know, it's only a church in Barberton. I want to say I will not have a small church mentality. Because if this is the garden that God has placed me in, I will work this garden. I will take care of this garden. And I want to promise you that because God has a predetermined outcome, that when you work in His garden, you will be successful. When you work in His garden, He will send the rain. When you work in His garden, He will send the growth. I don't care if you have a congregation or, 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 or business in Puff Adar. I don't care. If that is the garden that God has put you in, you will be prosperous. Because it's God's heart's intent that there will be growth if there's a man to do the work. So let's just back up for a moment. Can we back up? There's no rain. And because there's no rain, there's no growth. And because there's no growth, the reason for that is there is no man. God made man for them to work and keep. God sends the rain because there's a man to do the work. And because there's a man, listen to this, because there's a man doing the work, God sending the harvest. Some of us are only looking forward to the harvest. A lot of us here wants the harvest, but not the work. A lot of us is complaining about no harvest in my garden, no harvest in my life, but we're not complaining about being too lazy to work. So God has sent with a predetermined outcome in mind, with us made to have dominion over everything, the sea, the land, things in the heaven we say father we we we, we want that and now if we, we we're doing the the next thing we want to speak life into that without work that's called prosperity we want to speak life into dead situations and i do not have a problem by doing that but without doing the work And that's prosperity. Faith without work, without the works, dead. 
we cannot get past the word of God. And that's the problem. You can have prosperity in mind as much as you want. I will not be a prosperity preacher. It's not the more you give, the more you'll receive. The more you sow, and you are willing to work on what you are sowing, the more you will have a harvest and the more you will receive. There must be work. So these guys preaching prosperity say, well, I want to bless you because you did this. God will do. Listen, God already did everything he had to do. There's already a predetermined outcome for God. If only there's a man to do the work, God will send the rain and there will be harvest in your life. Can we give God hands? Only three of us are excited about this message. And I'm so scared that if you're not excited about this message, and there's not work, there will not be a harvest. And then you will come to me and say, please, sir, do you, do you, do you, have, you, have you watched Oliver Twist before? Please, sir, I want some more. Then they want some of my harvest because they are too lazy to work. Amen? Now I, I can see the frowns here. Are you not willing to share your harvest? Listen, let me tell you one thing. If there's someone sharing their harvest, it's Marley and me. We are sharing. We're actually giving what we can't afford. What are you giving? Not only in work, but in faith. There's people here in church, and I gave this in the first service as well. There's people here too scared to give, unfaithful to give. And I'm talking in everything, in time, yes, in finances, yes, in spirit and body and everything, yes. Are you giving what you're supposed to give? No. But I want the harvest. And we even quote scripture, we say, God, you are always faithful, even though I'm unfaithful. I want to tell you, he's also the righteous judge. And because you're unfaithful, you will burn in hell. We have to be faithful because he's a righteous judge. So this is not to, 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 to scare you guys. And it's not for you to judge me. I said, don't judge my glory if you don't know my story. I said, oh, they look happy. Pastor and Marley, they look happy. Four children, children in high school. Say, oh, they've got everything under control. Don't judge my glory. You don't know my story. Maybe two or three of you guys here know my story. From when we came here 15 years ago. And there were not even enough members in this church to have it a constitutional church. They couldn't even pay salaries for six months. They still owe me that money. You know that. There wasn't anything. Half of the people here liked us. The other half didn't like us. I don't know why. What's there not to like? But never mind that. We came here. And the one Sunday, half of the church, when I said, let's sing and let's worship and let's praise God, they were singing. And the other half, well, they were just looking at me. Because they want us to feel not welcome. And one of the pastors even said, you know what? You're too young for this place. They're going to kill you here. I was young. I was young. I was 26 when I got here. It's very young. First church. First wife. Only had one child. First child. First, first of many things. I don't know if I was brave or stupid, but I was here. God has planted me in this garden. I was working this garden. And I want to tell you, even though people don't like what you're doing, if you're in your garden, start working your garden. There will always be people that's against you. Start working your garden. So we were working this garden. And this one elder came to me and said, listen, I was here before you and before a lot of pastors I was here. And let me tell you something. I'll be here long after you're gone. I looked at this old man, 26, 88. What, what am I going to do? So I just thought, you know, I'm not going to do anything. 
Because I want to, you to realize one thing. Sometimes it's better to live something dead. I just looked at the statistics. I mean, 2688. If I stay long enough, I wonder who's going first. But listen, we have to live certain things dead. We have to prove them wrong. And the one Sunday, half of the church, the, the ones that didn't like us, they've decided they're not coming to church. They're going to a specific house and they're going to worship there together. But they've sent one guy so that when we hear in church, he will, he will go back to them and report back on, on it. What was the expression on my face when only 12 people came to church? There were only 12 people in that church, and that man was there as well. So actually only 11 people that wanted to be there, and two of them was Marley and me. So actually that's only nine other people that were in church that wanted to be here. And I ministered with everything in my heart. Don't judge my glory. If you don't know my story, I've worked hard in my garden. And the glory is not mine. I want to give the glory to my king, to the God of all. And after that service, a man came to me and said, Pastor, see what you're doing here, man. You are preaching the chase empty. You're not doing a good job. We still see a lot of reformed theology in you. And he turned around and walked away. He never came back. Thank you, Jesus. I'm coming a long way. I've worked this garden. I've not allowed people to look down at my age, look down at my capabilities. There's a lot of work here. And let me tell you what, whenever you want to do something new, whenever you want to do a new expansion in your garden, there will always be the negative people. I always, almost said donkeys. The moaning Israelites. The ones complaining. Come on, have you, have you ever started something new? And then people won't like that. Uh, let me tell you. Three years ago when I said, let's start the English service, there were people frowning at me. I said, no, pastor. <laughs> that won't work. Looks as if it's working currently. Do you enjoy it? I'm enjoying it. We are growing. Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. I'm working this garden. There was a piece of the garden that God has put me in that I couldn't work in because of a language barrier. And I weren't very English. People said to me, you are one of the guys from the free state. And do you think that Afrikaans tongue of you will ever be able to speak English? Well, not in the beginning. In the beginning, things were very difficult. But God help us. And we are growing every month. If you want the glory, you need to work. Trust God for the rain to enjoy your harvest. I want to proclaim something over this church. There's a harvest coming in this church like never before in history. There's a harvest. I want to say that we not only that, when I became the regional overseer, I'm, I've become a pastor of pastors. And now I not only have a church of 400 people, I now became a pastor of pastors that are pastors in church with members, and they all are my priorities. And now all of a sudden I've got a church of 7,000 people in Pumalanga. 
that's a harvest. I see that God is bringing harvest. Currently in our ministry, God is bringing a harvest. And because we are working the garden, God is sending the rain. And I'm about to just say it out there. Because of us that are willing to work and this church willing to do something, there will be a harvest like never before. It's your choice. It's your choice. Choice, choice, choice. Your decision you can make. Currently, we are expanding our garden even further. Do you want to know what we're doing currently? Currently, as we are busy here, on the 17th of June, we are having our task team meeting in Malalan. And on the 24th of June, we're having our first service in Malalan. This church is expanding. Hmm? There's not a full gospel church. There's not a man to do the work. So there's no rain. No harvest. Can I tell you, pray with us. Because we trust God for a great and a wonderful work. Not only that, we are looking at Nelspreit. And we are currently busy seeking a venue for us to start a campus there. So that there will be growth. There will be a harvest. Why? Because 15 years ago. And I'm not boasting in myself. This is just part of my testimony. Just hear this. There was a man willing to work a very difficult garden. In a difficult garden, that man started working. And not in his own strength, but by the grace of God, God sent the rain. And where God is sending the rain, there will be growth. And when there's growth, there'll be a harvest. And when there's a harvest, we know we are part of God's predetermined outcome that He has in store for us. I experience currently there's people sitting here say, there's no harvest. There's no harvest in your life. There's no harvest in your life. I'm speaking this into your spirit. There's no harvest in your life because there's no work. God will not send rain if there's no work. And some of us must really get to a point, and I'm, I'm touching on this so that you can understand this. Let's just go, go a bit further. Let's just go to Genesis uh, 2 verse 25. Say, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Adam and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I don't know about you, but I'm not really a guy that's actually scarred for by it. But I will not get undressed and walk here and not be ashamed. Is there anyone here that will walk in here naked and not be ashamed? I'm willing to try things in church. I mean, it's not that. Just a joke, just a joke. But they were not ashamed. What is the reason for them not being ashamed? No sin. And I want to say this. Some of us in church, because of sin, is so ashamed that you're even ashamed of your works and ashamed of your garden and you're not willing to work. And the devil has got an opportunity in your life because of shame in your life that you are not working your garden because of sin in your life you are not working your garden and if you're not working your garden God cannot send the rain and when God can't send the rain he can't send the growth and when there's no growth there's no harvest repent 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 get rid of sin in your life 
And it's easy for us to do the same than Adam in chapter 3, verse 12. I'll read it for us. And the man and his wife were both naked. Now go back one. Let's read that again. Because there was no sin. All right. We're no, not ashamed. They were not ashamed. Now let's look at this. Because they ashamed, chapter 3, verse 12, says this. The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit for the tree, and I ate that. He's not taking the responsibility. He's giving the responsibility away by just blame blaming his wife he says i'm not the one that's in dominion i'm not the one that's in charge of my own life i'm not the one chosen by you to do these things it wasn't me and even eve she did exactly the same in verse 13 Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The snake deceived me and I ate. It wasn't me. It was the snake. Can we, can we just go back? Let's, maybe we have to go back a lot of times in life. Because if you know where you lost it, you can find it again. Where have you lost Where have you lost your will to carry on? Where have you lost the dominion? Where have you lost your life? Where have you lost your marriage? Where? I don't care what is the situation of your garden currently, but if there is a man willing to do the work God will send the rain so that there will be growth and because of the growth there will be a harvest in your marriage in your business in everything and in every part of your life in church we are more than 12 here and if we started working the garden that we are in, I will promise you, God will send the rain over this church. Some of us are taking this. God will send the rain over this church, the rain in your life. All we need to do is work. Sonder verskonings, without excuses without saying no Lord it wasn't me it's because of this and because of that so I want to ask is God faithful is God doing what he said in his word he will do I want to ask he's not a man that he should lie he cannot lie he's God I want to ask the other part of this coin are you faithful and some of us even quote scripture say Thank God that He's faithful, even though I'm not faithful. You're walking on thin ice. It's the truth. God is always faithful because He's God. But if you're not faithful, I promise you, it will not determine that God will not be faithful over His promise. He keeps watch over His promise and over His word. We don't need to do that. We need to keep watch over our promises and our work so that God can send the rain so that there can be growth and a harvest. Now the problem with a harvest is God promise, listen, to all the businessmen and women, God promise, if you give me 10% of your harvest, I will bless the other 90% of your harvest. Maybe we are not successful because our harvest is not even blessed. And now we make excuses. 
we can't give it lord because it's adam because it's eve because it's this needs and these wants and this this and this that god wants to bless you start tithing start giving and it's not my word it's God's word. If you really want to be successful, and I can tell you success stories on success stories. And I'm just going to tell one, and I'm ending off with this one, about a man. And we, we've heard his testimony on the radio, Marley and me. He, was a, he had nothing, nothing. He lost everything. He was sitting in the street, and he got a job as a car guard. You know, it's the guy's watching over the cars and you give him something for that so i want to say don't say i've got nothing at least start to work i don't know why we just lay on the couch say lord bless me with the work start work start to work do something wash cars i don't care what do something god will honor your work and the moment he sees that you are working he will send the rain and because he was doing that work he heard about that and he heard about the harvest and he said father if i'm working and i've received a hundred grand today i'm going to start giving on this small piece of harvest that you are giving me so that you can trust me with more and send more rain for more growth for bigger harvest can you see how it's working and he walked to the nearest church and under the door he didn't know how to work he didn't know about about how to tithe and put it in the envelope and go to church and put it in there he wasn't even going to church but he knew he was putting the ten rand under the door and god was blessing him i want to tell you this story because he trusted god grew so out of proportion that he is one of the ceos of the biggest security companies in south africa today because he was working trusting God and his harvest grew more 